Hare Krishna. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'd like to welcome uh, everybody to this uh, long-awaited update on the Lokanath Swami case. Um, it was April of 2021 where the case was initially put to North American Leadership Council and addressed it to the GBC. Um, and lo and behold, on May the 8th and the 11th, respectively, they said, we recognize that we need to do something about this and we're going to give it to the CPO. And of course, we'll track what happened from that point onwards. Um, it was secretly taken back despite the public undertaking five days later, even though uh, CPO uh, had already contacted the victim's family and so on. I can't imagine what it was like for them to be messed around for another time. Um, and then around July, they said, look, we're going to do this panel thing. Of course, not forgetting the leak uh, with back to Chaitanya Swami, basically exposing to the world the underhand scheme of creating a panel. So we're going to look at all of these things. What is this panel? What did the report finally, you know, let everybody know has happened? Um and what is the current state of affairs? The GBC might believe they finally laid it to rest. This would be about the fifth time they perhaps believe that they've done that. Of course, because it's so indefensible, at some point it's inevitable the media will get hold of this. It remains an open sore and the campaign will continue and we'll just give our verdict today. So Shanaka, hopefully everyone would know Shanaka. He has been tirelessly campaigning for child protection. Uh, four years, and he certainly inspired me a couple of years ago to join him in that quest, having perhaps been, uh, you know, grumbling about his efforts up until that point. And Krishna Devata, both former Gurukulis, Krishna Devata, as we, as we said, is someone who wrote such a well composed uh, assessment of this entire case a year ago that it actually did trigger the GBC momentarily to go, oh, maybe we should finally take a principled approach, which they, of course, choked on later. So I'll let you say a few words by way of introduction for yourselves, and then we'll perhaps work our way through all the updates that we have to do. Uh, maybe we'll go to you first, Krishna Devata, if you had any, like, general musings to kick off with. Wow. Um, well, thank you first for um, inviting me back. Um, I'm also taking this somewhat as an update because, um, to be honest, this entire case has uh, caused my heart to create a lot of distance between um, our international society, community, and um, really just focus on my own children, protecting my own children. And also I've been um, renewing, gone back to higher education to become a teacher and hopefully to be a more educated advocate so that I can um, take it to the next level um, with my understanding. And um, I have also, been just trying to enrich my understanding of the child's rights established by the United Nations and um, all of those things. So that's where I'm at. I'm actually here to get updated as well and um, and uh, can comment on some of the happenings since uh, the last year. I think it's been more than a year, almost yeah, a year. Yes, over a year. Yes. Yeah, and, and the pain that you describe and the disillusionment would be shared by many devotees and many parents throughout the world. We should also mention that obviously you um, you you brought that case to uh, the American Leadership Council and the GBC with Saraswati. Saraswati wasn't able to join us today, but I'm confident mm -hmm. we'll have a session with Saraswati very very soon as well. Mm -hmm. She's possibly the most um, informed on the case and. Uh, we definitely want to involve uh, involve her. But let's go to Shanika as well. I mean, you've seen a lot of these things over the years, Shanika, so I'd love to get your thoughts on where we are at this point in history. Hari Bolo, Hari Bolo, everybody. Thank you for having me again. Um, uh, thoughts? I am 
Uh, I am quite. Uh, I mean, on, on one hand, the response of the GBC, the, the writing was on the wall. What they were going to do, as you mentioned, um, Bhakti Chaitanya Swami, kind of uh, uh, that leaked phone conversation, uh, kind of gave away his game plan, and things played out exactly as he said they would. Uh, they made a panel. The panel uh, made a decision that the, the GBC were happy with, uh, and then... Um, it kind of, uh, that's how things went. Uh, my concern is uh, that this decision they've taken is uh, short-sighted. They, uh, the, the ISKCON leadership, uh, the, the leadership of the Hare Krishna movement has chosen again to prioritize um, uh, short-term gratification at the cost of the huge long-term cost for the society for its reputation for its children for uh its moral uh credibility um i in england uh a few years ago there was a scandal with a very famous uh personality uh his name was uh, jimmy savile he was uh, uh he had a lot of interactions with the queen, just to give an idea of how famous this person was. Yeah. And there were multiple credible uh, allegations of child sexual abuse. And nobody wanted to touch it because this guy was so important, because it would look so bad. And he was working closely with the BBC. And it wasn't until after his death that everything exploded and came out. And I can, I dread to think the day that this is going to happen. Like maybe after looking at Tommy passes away, uh, then journalists will feel more com com comfortable to pick up a story like this and really tear up the legacy of Srila Prabhupada. Uh, and I dread, it, I dread that day. And on the other hand, I see that that's what the GBC has, uh, is setting in motion. And this concerns me. It concerns me that it concerns. It also saddens me to see how divided a society of Vaishnava is over an issue that should be so simple. Um, how can how can we allow as a society somebody who has abused a child to be a guru? And to me, that's like to me, it, there is there is no question about that. But somehow, yeah, I, I feel uh, that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. But back to you, Damodar. Yeah, thank you. Anyway, so let's kind of walk through um, one of the things that the uh, panel promised is a baseline of data, because after that carefully prepared case had been put and there started to be more and more documents released about what had transpired, there was also this sort of flooding the zone strategy by Maharaja's supporters trying to create all kinds of doubt you know the girl was put up to it by the brother-in-law and um you know that Radha Raman has exonerated Maharaj and the uh, specialist exonerated him and so on so the GBC aware of all of that misinformation said let's create a baseline now if you haven't seen it already anybody watching this go to lokanath.net you'll find all of the documentary evidence that we're describing here uh, the GBC panel report is there. And unsurprisingly, they didn't release their appendices, which is actually where all of the source literature is. And that's probably even more compelling reading. Mostly if you read the panel report, it's it's a bunch of legalese uh, to try and justify, as uh, Seneca already put it, the foregone conclusion that we would just, you know, let Maharaj off. Whereas if you look at the source data, so I'll, I'll ask you both. Do we now know what exactly transpired back in 1990 in the victim's home? Uh, I would, uh, sorry, Krishna, do you want to answer that? I, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Do we do we understand what happened? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, is it confirmed that actual sexual abuse took place? Has that now been confirmed beyond any reasonable doubt? Or is there still room for I, you know, I would, people to try and argue otherwise? I would say that the uh, GBC panel report and uh, all the 
recent documents released by the GVC put to rest beyond reasonable doubt for anybody who is reasonable that uh, Lokan Asami did sexually abuse this child. Uh, that's that's not uh, an allegation anymore. That's a confirmed fact by uh, the GVC's investigative panel. Uh, and that's perhaps the most important uh, and significant um, contribution uh, that this uh, investigation has delivered. Whereas before this, there was people who were hiding behind rumors and they were saying, well, maybe it happened, maybe it didn't. We're not sure uh, because looking at supporters are saying there was several versions, whereas now what happened is clear. The sad thing is that in spite of the uh, facts being clear, uh, the GBC still decided that, yeah, yeah, it's, he, he abused a child, but it's okay. He can continue being a girl. That's unfortunate. But at least I would say that is the significant, the most significant contribution of this uh, uh, panel report. Well, and Demidar, just to answer your question, the, the, for me, there's never been a question since that no, original, um, you know, secret panel of, uh, GBC um, executives took made an executive decision to publish a story. They uh, created the rumor. They created the public doubt from the beginning and spent 30 years trying to justify it and backfill it. And uh, they have known that it is a true allegation from the beginning. And the question for me is not is before the question of guru which is a very intense and important question is that he is a sannyasi and he committed this offense a great offense and crime while in saffron and continued in saffron there was never any break even though in many resolutions, the GBC has acknowledged these events and they have continually made actions that have really only imposed upon his guru activities. They've never imposed upon his sannyas. They've never imposed upon, uh, they've never taken proper legal action as an institution or shown any true interest in protecting children and they nullify all of their actions over the decades to have a child protection office they've completely delegitimized all of their actions for the past 30 years in the name of child protection and um said it's not important we would rather have a guru than a healthy, loved child. That's the message that they're sending and that they have sent my entire life. So just to um, to be really clear what the uh, panel report and the um, appendices indicate, the child's, the victim's testimony is there. Um, you can also see uh, correspondence in 1998, in particular, lots of correspondence with the GBC describing what now it's come to light. Until about 1998, there was just a handful of GBCs trying to handle it quietly. Um, 1998, it first sort of exploded into the public domain. There were even news um, news reporters all over it then. Um, it blew up again in 2010. It's very interesting to read Appendix E and see just how many of the GBCs uh, at that meeting, the minutes of that meeting were reporting in 2012. They had no idea it was so severe. At no point does Lokanath uh, refute, uh, but rather confirms that what he told Badu Narayan about how he uh, abused the victim uh, was there. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it, it should absolutely cast all doubt aside, notwithstanding the fact that there are people so committed to not believing that this has transpired and just wanting to portray Vedic Inquirer. We should stress Vedic Inquirer existed before the Lokanaswamy case. It will continue to pursue other cases. It obviously became very interesting to look at the Lokanaswamy case for all the reasons that you just mentioned, KD, that um, 
it's archetypal for the movement. It's a strong indication of, you know, has the movement grown over all these years or, in fact, has it regressed? I'd like to talk a little bit about um, some of the disinformation that's been attempted, uh, in particular, uh, Radha Raman Swami, who claimed to be a 24-hour-a-day eyewitness to everything that took place in that household. And, of course, he made testimony in the late 90s, and he made some updated testimony last year. Uh, the two accounts don't actually match. And, of course, the solution he came up with is he claims no ownership of the original account, which just sort of beggars belief. Sonica, I know you've studied those two accounts and the discrepancies between them oh, in some, some I, detail. I have. It was over a year ago. Uh, but yeah, he uh, he was the servant. Uh, he was rather a mandas at the time. He was a servant of Loknat Maharaj when he was staying with the family. Uh, he so as the servant, he was like his uh, uh, ironclad alibi. He claims that he was with uh, Loknat Maharaj twenty four seven, which would imply that he didn't sleep. He didn't. Uh, wash himself or use the restroom or anything <laughs> uh, and that uh, uh, at no time during the seven days that looking at Maharaj was at the house uh, of his family uh, did anything inappropriate happen because he was always a witness a constant witness uh, like the Paramatma uh, which is nonsense of course it's, it's not physically possible um, but uh, uh, for part of that week, he was actually not even in the house. That's uh, something that's uh, come up later. But uh, his um, uh, when when you sober, I did. Uh, I actually wrote an article where I analyzed both, uh, as you mentioned, and you can see that uh, uh, th they don't add up. The two, the, the, the two statements are completely, uh, not completely, but over several points, they don't, uh, they don't match up. Uh, and they, at least, at the very least, they cast a doubt on his uh, recollection. Uh, and that's the best case scenario. If you want to give him the benefit of the doubt, that, which is hard to give. But anyway, um, that is also, uh, that is also available. And I think um, it's on lokanet.net that uh, analysis yeah no it to it's, it's totally there and uh, there was a very telling uh, giveaway and the icc meeting that leaked this is one thing that the leaders should know their attempts to be clandestine in this day and age are bound to fail apart from the fact that not everyone in their committees is fully supportive uh, of their position and therefore has a propensity to leak it's the information age so it's all going to come out in the wash so i remember um david kinandan one of the indian leaders actually raised this point that radha raman swami was going to um write a testimony and he, he said words to this effect. You can find this. The, uh, the recording is also on lokanath.net. He said, we better make sure that those two accounts uh, yeah. match up. So if you think about making that statement, that is basically a tacit admission that these are likely fabricated. And well, but there's a good chance they won't naturally match up because of the fabrication. If someone's recalling something, they don't actually have to invent. And so they shouldn't have to worry about consistency. And of course, some of those inconsistencies, the problem, one of the problems they had with the second account is they had to make Marada's injury more severe. So in the first uh, testimonial written from the Bhakti house or whatever, Maharaj had sore ankles. Mm -hmm. But then because they were trying to dismiss or argue against Maharaj uh, pursuing um, uh, the victim into her cupboard uh, one morning, suddenly he had to be, you know, incapacitated to the point of not being able to walk. So they became broken legs or something way more severe. Um, the other inconsistency. Yes. Go ahead. No, no, well, the interesting thing is that uh, despite this... Uh, observation of the Vakinandan, they still uh, uh, went ahead and... <laughs> they still don't marry her. Yeah, exactly. Anyway. Well, I, I'd also like to point out the fact that what you said, Shanika, was really true in the sense that 
somebody can be a witness 24 hours a day. And if somebody, if a sannyasi needs that level of supervision, that's problematic to begin with. But um, the, the fact is that the incident, not only one incident happened, that there were uh, covert actions that happened behind harmoniums, that happened, you know, um, in all of these ways that are telling of uh, a covert effort to groom a child. And so the fact that even under supervision by his servant, he, uh, these, these um, advances on the child were made and uh, that shows a consciousness and an effort and a predatory pattern. So I think that really needs to be stated there as well. And they're not likely to be things that uh, an 11 year old would uh, consider how to make up. You know, whenever my mum walked by, he removed his hand from the offending area and he placed it back there despite protest afterwards and so on. Um, and, so, they're also, and they're also, as a somebody in a female body, the, those are kind of advances that are uncomfortable and can already cause the freeze response the freeze and silence, or, you know, she probably, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but from my experience of those types of advances, um, they can shock you into freeze or, mm. f or fright. And especially with somebody in a position of power and prestige, it's already a highly uncomfortable position and not something like that you can make up those kind of nuances. These are these are um, a pr very clearly a signature uh, of predatory pursuit. The credibility of the testimony is also very shonky. I mean, in the first one, we hear about the brushing of the hand inadvertently or keeping the hand, you know, to support the book on the child's lap, which in itself is quite bizarre. It's also kind of like, is that the kind of thing you would remember crystal clear eight years later if it was such an innocent and, you know, non-event? And then what we hear in the later one, it was there was tapping on Marad's thigh and then somehow that tapping on Marad's thigh moved over to the, the child's thigh and then the hand rested there for 30 seconds. It's, it's just not a credible account of behavior that one would actually ever witness. Um, it, it really smacks of desperation, a desperate attempt to try and account for known data, the, the, the touch and the location of the touch by trying to pass it off as something else. It, it, it... And it's not, none of it is proper sannyas etiquette. I, I, mm. I have been around many sannyasis and my children have been around many sannyasis and I know that, um, you know, my daughter has, n when she's around appropriate sannyasis, this, there's just no question. There's no sitting beside. Uh, and this is, you know, just, uh, this is a line that I also see is gone not drawing. They allow a lot of questionable behavior in the name of like, children are cute or something that they allow these boundaries to be crossed for, you know, children to be um, sitting so intimately with sannyasis who, if they, they really should set their own, if it was a grown woman, that wouldn't be so inappropriate. So when is that line drawn for, uh, and I want to say all children, because we know that children of both and all genders can be abused. I would also add that it, it's, it's not just uh, that children are cute, but there is this um, uh, baseless assumption, uh, okay, children are cute on one hand, uh, and maybe they get the blessings of the sadhu. Uh, but then there is the baseless assumption that uh, sannyasis are safe, uh, which if you look at Iskand, Iskand, Iskand's history, uh, there's uh, plenty of evidence to uh, suggest otherwise. 
uh, and these two com these two things combined, somehow there is this social acceptance that it's okay for sannyasis to, to touch children in even in intimate ways, which is really not. And with well, this decision I, just being made, it's just become that little bit even more unsafe. Yes. Predators because, will now feel empowered. The other thing is that when a child is given that much uh, public attention with a, such a elevated figure, it can cause a lot of psychological impact, whether it's positive or negative. But... You know, there's plenty of children who get that kind of attention, but then there's plenty of children who don't. And so it becomes this whole vying for attention and it's considered mercy. And so that creates a lot of confusion if there is ever abuse. These these boundaries are not in place um, to, to keep children safe. There's no boundaries. For children, I agree. Uh, I, I also, well, one more thing, then I'll let, I'll let you talk down there. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I was having a, um, I was having an exchange with a devotee specifically on this point, and he was saying, "Oh, I witnessed the. Um, I was in my Gurukul and I saw the children. They really uh, spontaneously had an attraction to go to this Swami. They really wanted to." Uh, uh, the intimate uh, with him, like uh, giving hugs and things like that. And I, and I pointed out to him that uh, children like attention in general. Uh, children uh, that are in a gurukul oftentimes have, uh, uh, I guess you can call them abandonment issues. You can call them whatever you want. They don't get, uh, they don't have access to their parents where they get healthy affection. So naturally they're going to want affection. And if, uh, if the Swami that comes twice a year, if that's okay to get affection from that, then of course they're getting, they're attention starved essentially, they're love starved. And yes, they will be attracted to that. But is it healthy for the Swami to reciprocate and encourage that? I say absolutely not. This not. is this is a very important point. I'm sorry. I know we're, we have a timeline to get through, but <laughs> it's all good. There's something called attachment theory, you know, and uh, in in our philosophy we talk about detachment but biologically physiologically children need attachment and affection and uh that attachment and affection is appropriately given by their family members and um this dynamic that has been created in iskon for many decades actually deteriorates the strength of the family because children are separated from their families often or have been historically and this uh this idea of being so attached i understand that you can have that attachment to a guru but they don't have the development to make a choice about a guru so this is just all a very socially supported um, attention that isn't necessarily developed spiritual consciousness. And um, I just think that there's, there's really a lot of uh, layers to unpack there in terms of their, their emotional impact on children. And it's totally inappropriate for sannyasis to be filling that gap where they've lost the attachment from their own parents and um, are often maladaptive in their attachment and capacity for secure attachment in healthy relationships in the future. No, the, and this, 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 um, this lack of um, parental uh, love and attention and uh, even physical exchanges with their parents, a hug from their parents, makes these children more vulnerable. Yeah. And uh, when a, a, a sannyasi or a spiritual leader figure um, gives them that attention, uh, especially when it's physical, it's it's a kind of grooming. Uh, even if this, even if the sannyasi, that's not the intention of the sannyasi, it uh, it teaches the children it's okay to interact in this 
physically, uh, sometimes intimate way with um, uh, certain uh, older men. And that uh, that is always bad news. It, it, it makes it, it definitely makes the children more vulnerable. Sorry, Dumbledore, back to you. No, 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 it's, it, it, it's an important point. And I think, as you said, the stake mm -hmm. in the ground that's most significant here is sexual abuse happened. I'm gonna just be slightly graphic for one moment and then leave this behind. Perhaps the most compelling statement in that whole panel report was from the 2012 minutes where Badra Narayan confronts Lokanath and says, you told me you felt her out. Now that's a very graphic, uh, you know, uh, language to describe a certain kind of uh, touching. Um, it corresponds with her own, the, the victim's own mention of the private part. That was also mentioned in the confession letter. Um, we had a very surprising response from one lady who came out and supported Lokanath Swami. Well, how else is a sannyasi supposed to learn about, you know, a young girl's anatomy or something? It was just an incredible uh, statement. Uh, unbelievable. Let's move on. So um, although the victim told her mother, but they withheld it from the father, but I believe the father may have even passed away without ever knowing what happened here. Yeah. Um, uh, it was three years later before the mother raised, you know, this concern and a small group of, uh, I think, pretty much almost all sannyasis. There were a couple of householders as well, but some senior ISKCON leaders uh, met with the family. Now, one question, I don't know if any of us are in a position to answer this. This might be one for Saraswati. Did they ignore mandatory, mandatory reporting requirements as per New Jersey law? In other words, did, oh, did the very absolutely. fact that they didn't take this to the law at the time constitute an illegal act on ISKCON's part? Uh, it's completely misconduct by the ISKCON leadership. So they had the instinct to try and handle this all hush-hush in-house. In Obviously... Um, they specifically kept it from the father. They asked the family not to go. They persuaded the family not to go to law enforcement. And they said, we'll deal with this and we'll make sure proper things are done here. Um, and of course, the family felt very let down by the perceived lack of, you know, appropriate sanctions and so on that one would expect. I'll just pause in case either of you have something. And then I'd like to talk about the so-called professional adjudication by CAP, CAP Associates. Uh, I just, yeah, I mean, mandatory reporting, that's quite uh, it's, it's a very specific legal term. I think maybe Yashoda was perhaps the only person involved Obliged. that uh, fell under that category. Uh, but certainly there was uh, a dereliction of duty on the part of the GBCs involved, I would, I would say, at the very least, uh, for failing to uh, uh, inform the, uh, failing to inform, and as you said, they didn't even discourage the family from reporting to the police. The thing is, is that every, uh, mandatory reporting laws are different in different places, but anybody can be a, be a reporter to law enforcement and uh, the temple president and his wife. Uh, maybe you guys can fill in the blanks on the names. Uh, Ravindra, Ravindra Saroop, and I and forget his wife's name. Had specific interactions with the, uh, the child and her family and they also failed to report. And so at every level of leadership, there was a failure to report. And uh, at that level, it was, uh, I would say it was political. Um, on the, with the case of Yashoda, she was a disciple of Bir Krishna Swami, and he was in the secret uh, panel that took executive action to bury the incident from the beginning. So the, um, you know, master servant dynamic of, you know, disciple, uh, disciplehood, <laughs> uh, you know, really compromised her integrity as a mental health 
provider. And so there was just a breach of integrity and a failure of leadership on every level at every point of their contact with the victim and with this case in general. You did some analysis of um, the many departures in the documented interview from you know, child or victim friendly um, conduct and safe conduct and so on. Um, that's also available, I believe, on the uh, loganapp.net, isn't it? No, that was a that was a private um, discussion that I had that was really um, an, an analysis of how she led the the witness, so to speak, or the the, the interview with the victim. And that even in her interview, it was uh, very inappropriate. And um, that first contact uh, with the victim should have been an interview with a neutral party. But instead, she was, you know, as I said, she was a disciple of somebody who had a vested interest in silencing the case. So um, that was evident in the way that she questioned and conducted the interview. And so in every interaction with the victim, they compounded the wound and abuse. It would became not only abuse, child abuse, but it became abuse of power and misconduct by the institution. And as we know, she also became so disillusioned with the handling of uh, child protection matters that she subsequently left the movement, giving that as her reason that she couldn't, um, she couldn't be associated yeah. any longer with the well, movement. Oh, I do too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. And, uh, and I know I, that there's others. I know that there was like literally in the re in real time, I know of Guru Kulis who were, you know, aspiring disciples of Lokanath. And she also left and lost faith. So that's just to name a few. This has had a, a severe impact on people's faith in, uh, in ISKCON. Not necessarily. I'm, I have faith in Krishna, but I don't... I, I don't seek association in ISKCON. So Jasoda did that interview and that the documents for that can be found um, in the panel appendices and uh, on lokanath.net. Um, let's move on then. So part of the reason that the GBC are now giving for why this shouldn't be reviewed again is they believe that A, there was no CPO back in those days. It wasn't set up till 1998. This happened in, well, at least this came to light in 1993. But they referred it to an even more professional body, uh, which is Ken Cullen's uh, Child Abuse Prevention Associates, CAP Associates. Um, you know, much could be said about, you know, what we've learned about CAP Associates. But I'll, I'll before I share what I believe, I'll ask if you have any information or views about CAP Associates and the professional job that they did. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, uh, the uh, uh, Anuttama quoted uh, in his uh, ISKCON News, um, press release or whatever you want to call it, he mentions the, what you just said that uh, they it was never looking at the case was never handed over to the uh, uh, CPO because the incident took place prior to the formation of the CPO. Uh, Dear Govinda, uh, in one of his our interviews with him, he pointed out that when the CPO was formed. Uh, they processed some 300 cases uh, of uh, child abuse incidents that took place. I don't remember, don't quote me on the number, I don't remember the exact number, but it was uh, a high number of child abuse cases that took place prior to the formation of the CPO. And looking at Slani to date is the only one that the GBC has, 
has refused and continues to refuse to hand over to the CTO. So that is uh, a very weak uh, excuse that I'm going to put forth. Uh, regarding your question, uh, they, my understanding is that this body was used by the Catholic Church to bury and protect their own child abusers. So the fact that ISCOM went and found these guys to give an uh, interview and uh, assess Lokanet is uh, both very telling and concerning. Uh, even so, um, they did uh, mix, uh, they, they did, I think they did say that he should stay away from children and they said that, what did they say? I'll read you some yeah. of the highlights of their- um... Yep, go for it of their report in a moment. But let's see, K, KD, do you have um, anything to say on CAP Associates, their credibility or the quality of their work? Well, just what Shanika said, that the GBC already had an intention to conceal and um, justify, uh, minimize the case by using somebody who had specialized in dealing with Catholic priests, which, you know, <laughs> need I say more? I mean, the Catholic priests point to the Hare Krishnas as examples of child abusers in our uh, priesthood and, and we point to them, so. Were. Yeah, they were generally employed as witnesses, expert witnesses for the defense of the accused priest. So they're used to actually trying to argue and advocate on behalf of abusers. So yeah. it's a very strange choice. They were obviously also struck off a couple of years later for tax fraud. So it doesn't exactly cover them in glory in terms of their ethical um, conduct. Well, and um, just to point, say, I mean, comment on that is that sometimes tax fraud is the only way to take down Al Capone. People, <laughs> yeah, people who are unethical on many other levels and are difficult, uh, you know, organized crimers. <laughs> and so in this case, you know, that's just an indication of the, the lack of integrity of that firm. Let, so let's I'm going to read. Yeah, let's just yeah. say that Anutam are quoting them as uh, they're not they're, they're not the, the best character wins. Well, I'd like to quote from a few of the GBC's own sort of documents of CAP's outputs. Go for it. And they kind of speak for themselves, really. The CAP Behavior Associates team also received a report from the psychotherapist, DeSoda, who had interviewed the victim. After the evaluation was completed, members of CAP team met personally with some members of the GBC, explaining their findings and answered questions. The following are their major findings. So it should be said, these are not their direct words. These are the GBC reporting their words, but they are attributing these conclusions to CAP associates. Lokana Swami is not a paedophile. He presents no danger to children. Now, we're going to come back to this because it also appears there's a little bit of a sleight of hand being used. Um, technically, obviously, a paedophile is someone who's attracted to a certain age of child. Um, he may not be specifically attracted. We know there's a current rape allegation, so he may not actually be that choosy about... Um, victims um so this some people think that this means they exonerated him from having committed an act of abuse far from it they've just made a technical argument and in some ways their technical argument is explained by the next statement although the girl was young she had begun the transition to womanhood and lokanasami did not sexually relate to her presence as that of a child in other words um even though she was 11, apparently she came across somewhat older and therefore we're ruling out the paedophile thing because, you know, he related to her as if she was older. I mean, it's it's astonishing thing to actually say that this 11 year old it is this not only hints of victim blaming, but there almost is an attempt, a direct attempt to try and take out the disgust factor. You know, well, she looked older. 
uh, as if somehow that makes the uh, the offence but I okay. think but but I think it's um, uh, it, it, there might be a lot in the the actual definition of the word pedophile because they uh, oh for sure uh, so technically speaking uh, uh, what is the technical definition of pedophile I think it's, it's, it's a particular age group hebophiles is a slightly older age group yeah. they do mention the broader term paraphilia later yeah. And they, they don't know that they have enough evidence to guarantee there's a paraphilia. But that doesn't mean abuse didn't happen. It could be an opportunistic offender. Yeah. Um, but people misconstrue. They think he was exonerated by this group. Not at all. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I'll let you finish your point. Uh, no, 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 nothing. It, it's just a technical term. So technically, it might be right. As you said, it doesn't mean he didn't abuse a child. It doesn't mean that what he did is appropriate. It certainly doesn't mean that it's okay for him to be a sannyasi and a guru. It's, it's, it's just, exactly. But somehow, but somehow, that's one of the argue, one, of, uh, one of the other arguments brought forth by Anuttama, which it, it's like what I, I don't know. Yeah, anyway, the, the whole uh, the whole of uh, Anuttama's document is quite uh, uh, weak, to put it lightly. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I've specifically asked him given that he's made the statement no risk, no further risk, given that there's a current rape allegation being investigated right now, um, what, how exactly is he going to justify, A, that this decision was made, and B, that he made statements like no further risk if that comes out and finds that he was guilty? Um, he'll, he'll, it, he'll spend something else. <laughs> well, he, he might. He might try. Damodar, I think it is a bit of a splitting of hairs here in the, in the sense of trying to exonerate him based on he's not a pedophile. That this is, um, you know, trying to create technicality around the fact that it was uh, maybe a, a, a crime of access, but it was still a predatory, um, predatory behavior. And so um, I know from being a mother and, uh, and sorry. Keep, yes, keep going. yeah, sorry, we just see the comment now. Um, I know from personal experience and from as a mother of a daughter that the that that, um, you know, that age of a girl is extremely vulnerable that uh you know there there are i i personally feel that that's when uh people in a female body start to really feel the predatory nature of the world um when they hit uh that you know age of um pubescence and it's uh, but they have, regardless of him, the predator, the victim is still a child. It doesn't it doesn't negate the fact that she is a child. She has the consciousness of a child, the development of a child, regardless of her body. I mean, it the the statement really objectifies her. Right? Say, oh, because her body has changed, she's no longer a child. That's completely inaccurate. Well, it's an obnoxious argument to make. I'm, I'm posting some of these comments that I haven't been attentive enough to notice because I was reading on another screen. What, what, so, what is, yeah. what is gr grand larceny? Oh, yeah. I'm going to have to get someone else to do the definitions of these terms. The point is... the. The point is that you can see here what he did would attract a 15-year prison sentence if found guilty. Yeah, now, that's, that's actually a point that we've skipped over. Um, according to New Jersey law, what Lokanaswamy did, about which there is no doubt anymore, uh, was a seven-year prison sentence. It, it, that's what it attracted. That's what the GBC have allowed him to be off the hook. So for all the talk since of double jeopardy and due process and how can you make the... No, no, the point is they actually got him off the hook. They, they broke all principles of due process. And so trying to introduce, oh, you can't revisit this case because it's double jeopardy. Well, it, it's a pretense well, that, you know, any kind of justice has actually been shown so far. The double jeopardy, uh, you know, commentary is completely inappropriate because the GBC is not a judicial body. 
It's a religious institution. Yeah. So yeah. they're taking it upon themselves to circumvent actual law enforcement and actual laws of the land and decide for themselves that they've already tried it. And that's not double jeopardy is in the, you know, is one of is part of our uh, Fifth Amendment uh, in our Constitution of the United States. And so that's completely misapplied. So let's just scrap that like double jeopardy should never be used in this case. It's completely inaccurate. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and that's part of the intention of just talking these things through to show how many red herrings and dishonest forms of argument have actually been deployed. Let me finish off with uh, the rest of what CAP associates, because it, it kind of gets even more shocking to some extent, although that last one was pretty... Uh, Pretty amazing. Lokana Swami had been brought up in a way that kept him entirely innocent of the experience of sexuality. He had not undergone the normal or at any rate rest and adolescent struggle of coming to grips with sexuality and sexual feelings. Thus, when he found himself put into close association with this young girl, some sexual feelings unexpectedly arose, but these feelings were new to him and he did not know exactly how to acknowledge them or cope with them. The normal reflexive restraints and inhibitions that that people experience would have established, sorry, that experience would have established in him were not in place, and he yielded momentarily to impulse and thus acted in a transgressive manner. Talk about weasel words. Oh, Apparently, the poor Swami was just overtaken by the allures of this 11 year old. Yeah. You know, Damodar, I'm sorry, I have to jump in with this one. Of course, I'm, be I'm like trying to provoke you. <laughs> So, by the way, this is butter. Krishna loves butter. This uh, this little living entity here on my lap. But um, uh, his name is Butter. Huh? His oh, name I thought is... you were going into a butter and fire metaphor. No, <laughs> for a second. That, could, that may be applicable. Okay, so it starts off by um, framing it culturally. So there's there's um, this idea that culturally he wasn't familiar with being around women. Well, that, that's just not an accurate um, depiction of Indian culture. Anybody in India knows that there's significant gender segregation. And, and at the same time, there's plenty of exposure to family members and whatnot. So it's just, it, it just has no founding. And if somebody is that, um, you know, first of all, did he not go through puberty himself? He must have learned about his own body. So it, the whole founding of that argument is completely uh, ridiculous. But it also, one of the, the crux of that argument is that it frames him as the innocent one and as and childlike. And it still admits in the end that there was a transgression. And so still we're looking at a sannyasi who requires 24-7 supervision so that he doesn't transgress in this innocent way and put children, women and children at harm. And Maharaj's followers have interpreted these passages as he wasn't even capable of any sexual abuse because the very impulses were you know, um, unknown to him. They were, you know, so they've just completely misunderstood how this has been presented. The thing is that Indian culture does not allow for these things. Like, you know, anybody who's been to India knows you cannot touch a woman. Like, if I was drowning in the Yamuna, I don't know that men would, would save me unless, like, literally life and death was at hand. Um, if but they, also, uh, they, so sorry, they, go ahead, Katie, sorry. In any other case, it is a transgression. There is absolutely no touching. And he knows that if he's a sannyasi and an Indian man. Absolutely. No, I mean, uh, before the, my guess is that before this incident, uh, Lokanath Swami uh, gave uh, countless classes uh, where he talked about the dangers of, uh, like every other class, uh, you know, where they talk about the dangers of uh, associating with women because, uh, and how a sannyasi and brahmachari should not associate with women. It's like saying that uh, somehow Lokanath Swami didn't know that as a sannyasi, he's not supposed to 
spend time with women. Uh, I actually remember um, that Lokana uh, had written uh, an article that was published either in Manu's As It Is or Muddy's Stand and Fight. I don't remember which one it was. One of those magazines that were uh, the, the Guru Coolies were uh, publishing in the, when was it? Was it the 90s, Katie? Yeah, yeah it was. Uh, in one of those magazines, there was an article written by Lokanat Swami. And one of the things that Lokanat Swami wrote in the article uh, was that where he was warning the Guru Kulis about, uh, so he, he was talking about Guru Kulis reunions, say, you guys should, it's good that you get together and do your Krishna conscious thing, but it's really important that you don't use the word intermingle between boys and girls too much. That was one of the things that he wrote in that article. Which is uh, hilarious, uh, sadly hilarious, tragic comic, I guess, given the circumstances that well, have unfolded. He ha he also has a documented history of being reprimanded for spending too much time with his female secretary. Yeah, so th this was prior to the incident. So prior to the incident, the GBC uh, pulled him up and said, "Hey, you're spending too much time with secretary." And and a couple of years later. Uh, he's still doing it, and uh, he was spending time alone with two of his secretaries. It's recorded that he was in this and they were, these It's important to mention that at the time, these secretaries are young and hot. But anyway. Well, it's also important to note that he was also pursuing those uh, that access. Yeah. And that, he, that this idea that he was completely innocent is completely not true. No, it's baseless. On any, on, on so many counts. As much as like he might, they might want to say technically he wasn't a pedophile. He was taking the opportunity to, you know, touch this girl with an incredibly huge power differential um, between gender, between age, between position of power. Um, that even an adult woman might be intimidated to report any kind of inappropriate behavior. Well, you're making a really important point, isn't it? If a janitor touches a kid, that's it. He's never employed again. What to speak of someone in a position of trust who was only invited into that family home yes. on the premise of being a saintly person? Who was then encouraged? Could you give you know some Indian culture to this young lady? Um, it's 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 absolutely unthinkable that we would say yes. For by all means, stay in that same position of trusted authority. It's it's it's. The point is that the GBC are foolish if they think they've laid this to rest because this will keep coming back up. And at some point, the media will absolutely have a field day. And I think your point, Sanika, earlier, the, you know, the BBC and others have kind of indicated already that, you know, maybe because of libel or slander laws, they won't do it while he's alive. But this is absolutely registered with them as a very newsworthy event. Um, and, you know, Anutama will be called to answer and explain some of his statements. Well, he may, he may or may not be around uh, when, well, someone uh, when that happens. Well. But they're, def they're definitely planting a time bomb uh, for whoever is going to have, is gonna, whoever will be around to pick up the pieces. I, we've already passed the hour and we haven't even started uh, looking at Anutama's... Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll get there. So I'll, I'll speed up if that's okay. Go All right. <laughs> Last couple of things from the CAP report. Uh, I'll jump past a couple of the other little bullet points. Lokanath Swami's entire identity and sense of self is built upon his role as a religious leader, and it's a role to which his personality is exceptionally well suited. Given the unique conditions that prompted the episodes, and given the fact there is no reason to expect such episodes to occur again, Lokanath Swami should remain in his role as a religious leader. However, this does not negate the girl's legitimate feelings of violation and abuse. Now, that is a, a, admittedly a GBC, this is what they told us kind of um, statement. But I'll actually read something from CAP Associates uh, directly. Thus, given the above detailed character and personality analysis, we do not believe, they basically did a few um, psych tests. We do but not believe that Swami Loganath suffers from any paraphiliac condition. 
and does not pose a danger of overt sexual violence toward women and children. So, you know, good luck if the 2010 allegations prove um, founded. These findings do not negate the fact that he acted in clearly an inappropriate manner or that the girl who was a recipient of these acts may have experienced many traumatic sequelae common to victims of sexual abuse. So they sort of stop short of saying he abused her, at least here, but that, you know, the victim will basically respond as having been abused. It's, it's just word jugglery, really. Um, yeah, so taking a leaf out of your book, let us progress to some of the other things, because I would like to spend quite a bit of time breaking down Anutama's... Uh, that, that, that was a very Swami-centered uh, observation. Uh, the, the, the poor guy, uh, he, his identity is that of a spiritual leader. It's like it, 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 uh, it, it gives the perpetrator at least as much, if not more, uh, prominence as the victim. Uh, anyway, They're simultaneously acknowledging that the victim's life may actually now be destroyed, but please yeah. don't destroy the perpetrator's yeah. life. Yeah. He's got nothing to fall back on, poor fellow. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, just a couple of other little bullets. Much is made of the fact by Lokanath supporters that the family haven't themselves pursued legal action, which they argue either they're not bothered about it or don't have a case. And I generally kind of, you know, liken them to Sukuni in terms of the taunting manner in which they do this. Um, the level of, you know, threats, intimidation, name calling, disinformation has absolutely been what? stunning. They came forward to the ISKCON leadership and they have twice have been suffering At least. From high, high levels of intimidation and harassment and scrutiny. And it was actually ISKCON leadership who is in a position to be the mandated reporters. So, um, well, Ravindra Sarup promised the family that Lokanath would not hold a position of that. That was the promise that Ravindra made at the time to the family. It's important to, uh, and, and that was kind of the promise he made in exchange for them not going to the, and then, yeah, even recently the family received uh, threatening calls from some of Lokanath's more uh, uh, well, ardent funny. followers. There's also been, um, you know, visits to their family members' homes by GBC members. I mean, they they have a long list of ways that they've been uh, harmed by the institution. They were doxxed very early on, uh, you know, in the last year or so um, by Lokanath supporters, you know, basically um, disclosing their family identity. Yeah, they, they were uh, doxxed. But they've been, but before it was even more widely known, they've had very direct um, intimidation efforts directly by GBC members. So the fact that, um, you know, they haven't gone to the police, they've, the, they've suffered the weight of the entire institution landing on one little girl. And this has impacted her entire life. So, and nothing, nothing compared to, I mean, whatever they say the impact on the Swami, how it's impacted her. And I, you know, clearly we want to protect the details of her life, but all I, it's just been a lifelong impact. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the ongoing distress is obvious from what she wrote in 2010. All right, so progressing through. Um, initially, they decided, yes, we'll keep him as a guru. After all, the you know, CAP associates have encouraged us to do so. They gave him a two and a half year time out. Even that, he was supposed to communicate, communicate from initiating. Um, they, he was supposed to communicate to prospective disciples in the future. Um, we know Abai, is it Abai Charan from New Zealand? Uh, you know, he was told, oh, I'm, I'm going to save you over till 1996. Prabhupada sent him a year, it'll be a more special initiation. He wasn't told that the real reason for the suspension. And uh, he was highly disillusioned when that actually became um, 
apparent. So there's a lot of activity and a lot of uh, paper trail from 1998, which is when it seems because it somehow leaked out. Um, and in particular, I think uh, Times of India were running a few articles on this. Uh, suddenly the GBC had to go into damage control and they started to release some statements. Um, now, big, big question that often comes up is, has Lokanath actually confessed or not? Um, you know, if you listen to different people, they might argue, oh, he never wrote those letters of confession. And, um, you know, that's just other people putting words in his mouth. Uh, does the panel report shed any light on this? Well, I'd like to actually back up for a moment and say okay. <laughs> this whole thing of like time out of yeah. initiating disciples, this again, just draw to me, the entire case discredits the GBC and their guru system, because at what point, if they're acknowledging that some indiscretion happened, like to put it lightly, um, as a sannyasi, so the punishment is to no longer just do initiations for a few years. What is supposed to happen during that time? What kind of therapy or purification or atonement is really supposed to happen here? Like my question is, if a pure devotee is supposed to be pure or if they're supposed to be celibate and they're wearing saffron and they never take that saffron off. Do they, when do they, where's the, uh, there's a discrepancy there. Where, was, where was is it, that? Was it, there's no was, reconciliation for me. Was, of like, was, it, was, he pure before, was he pure before the incident or did he become pure after the incident? Yeah, is he pure now? <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's it's farcical, isn't it? Um, because mm. you know. Sorry, go ahead, Damodar. Well, the, the the role of guru couldn't be a more sanctified, uh, you know, entrusted role, and now we're basically saying, uh, even this most horrific of acts, people who do go to prison for this generally get picked on by the other prisoners because even in prisoner code, this is the lowest of the low. Um, and yet we're saying, no, this Sakshadhari Twina Samasta Shastra, this person is um, as good as God, speaks on behalf of God, can deliver you back to God. Um, but we just need to, you know, give him a, put him in the naughty corner for a couple of years because, because of what he did. Yeah. Let's race through a little bit. I'm mindful that we do Sorry. want to, Anna. No, no, no. It's, the point is, all of this actually does need to be properly aerated. All right, so Lokanath's confession. So you can see all the iterations of the confession letter, which was, yes, a collective work on the behalf of many writers at the GBC. But you can also see on those Lokanath's own attempts to, you know, influence the wording in particular ways and so on. So it certainly wasn't his um, sole work. DeSoda even said she had to pen an earlier apology letter because he didn't seem to understand the gravity of what he'd done. Um, but the letter that does exist, A, he has signed, and B, he was certainly one of the many authors of. Others basically got involved because he kept trying to water down the account of the issue. Uh, and but also, and various uh, other things. to date, Lokanath has never uh, uh, officially... Uh, stated that fessed up. Yeah, no, not fessed up. He's never said this letter is not authentic. I never wrote that letter. I did not sign that oh, letter. So. He's, he's never uh, negated the authenticity of this letter. So, given that this letter uh, was acknowledged by the GBC uh, panel, given that he has never uh, negated its authenticity. Um, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the letter is uh, that that is uh, is genuine. That's what he wrote. That's what he that's what he signed, and that's what he did. There is no question in my mind uh, whether he was helped in writing it. That it, it's a true account of the events, at least. Yeah, and in addition to that, it also the fact that it was a collaborative effort with 
the GBC and Yashoda. This also calls into question that the entire institution was organizing itself to support the abuser and to defend the abuser and to try to uh, minimize the, the crime and offense. And, and Yashoda herself, this is really where it's very telling that she was there on behalf of the abuser, interviewing the victim. So it's an incredibly un, um, unprofessional, to say the least, uh, process of dealing with any victim of sexual abuse. Um. Okay, so I'm going to progress on a little bit here. Oh, I can't even find my notes. Here we go. Um, so obviously it blew up again in 2010. Uh, 1998, we sort of talked about that was when um, ISKCON finally set up a CPO. It did review every other case, but this one was always withheld. Um and this is a clear sign, you know, with it coming up again in 2010, that it just won't go away, despite the uh, GBC's irritation and best efforts to get it to go away. So let's come to sort of last year. Um, you know, in April, you prepared your analysis of the case to date, uh, and you and Saraswati wrote. And very quickly, uh, well, maybe about 10 days later or something, the North American um, Leadership Council basically said, we hear you. And although we consider it was handled in a good faith uh, manner in the past, actually there were many serious omissions. We will now send it to the CPO. Three days later, the uh, executive committee of the GBC said the same thing. And CPO did in fact receive all the case files, which they described as voluminous. Um, they even went as far as contacting the victim's family, but within five days, it was secretly withdrawn. So a public undertaking. And of course, what we know happened in the meantime is that ISKCON India flexed its muscles and said, we're not having any of this. Now, do we actually happen to know what kind of threats that are made? We often hear talks of secession and we even see um, those kind of threats in, in the writings of people like Vasa Ghosh. Recently, we saw it on the, the female Diksha Guru issue. Um, you know, do we believe that this is why the GBC just lost their nerve? Like they had this initial moment of clarity. We should give this to the CPO. That's what all our resolutions say we'll do. They all say that we won't keep, you know, people who committed this kind of crime in a leadership position, we have removed people for less. You know, why, uh, why the U-turn? What on earth happened there that made them do the U-turn? I mean, I obviously, I, I don't know what, I'm not privy to what whatever conversations took place, uh, but that is my best guess. India, uh, they made a threat to secede, to separate from uh, ISCA North America. To me, not just the rest of ISKCON to say we're going to do our own ISKCON and uh, we're, uh, we're, we're going to take all our temples and our money. And to me, what the GBCs are not, don't seem to appreciate is the fact that India can make that threat. And the fact that the GBC believes them and believes the threat to be credible enough that they would, uh, that they would allow that threat to influence their decision. Uh, it tells me that the GBC has already lost uh, control of India, ISKCON India. Anyway, it's, it's a, like whatever control they think they have is very cosmetic. They don't have any substantial uh, control over the, the, the people and the assets that are in India. That's already, that's a, that, that train already left some time ago. And the irony of it all is, from, from my perspective, is that the GBC uh, in from any external unbiased observer uh, that looks at how they handle the Lokanet case can see that the GBC compromised um, integrity for uh, convenience and for power and for uh, to try and retain those things. 
they come from they didn't make a principle based decision on the Lokanath case uh, because they didn't want to lose India. But now the irony is that it looks like they're going to lose India over the female Diksha Guru thing. So they're going to lose India anyway. So they lost their principle and they lost what they were trying to hold, which is ironic in a way. But yeah, let, let's see how things play out. Yes, and um, we saw in the leaked ICC, uh, you know, meeting uh, those kind of things being discussed. You know, those very kind of threats uh, being yeah. discussed. Um, all right, we did see a massive disinformation campaign and threats and so on. And probably the most uh, unfortunate, at least one of the most unfortunate, was Namras giving his entire platform to uh, one of Lokan Aswami's apologists, uh, Sanat Sanatan, to yeah. <laughs> basically sow disinformation. Now, I contacted Namaras beforehand. I even sent him some of the documentation, like the victim statements and so on. Um, and he thought, what well, in his mind, fair reporting meant, well, everybody's heard, you know, the case against Lokan Aswami. I'm going to provide the case for the defense and because we said look by all means have some accident on but get someone from the other side of the tracks on this as well and he refused um, well the, the 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 interesting the timing of it was interesting because uh namras had asked me to speak on his podcast and uh i told him that uh i would if i was coming i would like to speak on uh, the Lokanat case and he canceled last minute. And uh, he, the, uh, the reason that he gave me was that uh, he said, uh, oh, this case is too hot to handle. And then the next thing I know, he gave my exact slot that same day when I was scheduled to speak. Sanak Sanathan went on to speak about Lokana. And I was like, OK, so maybe that wasn't. Anyway, that's how it turned out. Um, I find it unfortunate. I find it uh, it's. Uh, Certainly a disservice to child protection uh, in ISCON, but you know, hey, it's, it's his podcast. He can do what he wants. What can I say? Well, it added insult to injury because essentially he allowed um, allowed someone to argue that the 11 year old victim was part of a conspiracy, but with the, involving the brother in law. Well, he didn't to... just he didn't just allow it. He gave him a platform to speak. Um, yeah. Well, well that's, his, that's his choice. Aside from that, you know, some of the things that I thought was telling of that interview is there was further damage because the fact that uh, Sunak Sanatan commented on the abuse of his own children and that it had been dealt with by ISKCON. So... That was his his way of saying that Iskon did their job, and it, and they did, and he seemed to think that that was acceptable. That is not an acceptable stance for child protection. That abuse happens. That's just the way it is. That's that's just kind. He was normalizing child abuse in that yeah. interview. Yeah, it was shocking. He, and by of his own children. And then justify, you know, elevating Iskon saying they, they dealt with it. So if you look at, uh, you know, an institutional culture, the, the culture of an institution, um, that comes through in its policy and culture. And if that's our level of thinking that child abuse is dealt with, we are in for decades more trouble. Um, because that is not, the fact is, is that the abuse shouldn't happen, that each and every child in a community of Krishna consciousness should feel loved and valued and know that they are a child of Krishna. And that is not the experience of any child who suffers neglect and abuse. And that's, it's, I think that there were a lot more uh, subtle implications of damage that was in that interview that besides just his apologist, uh, you know, language around, aside from the fact that he's a disciple, so clearly not a neutral person discussing the case. 
but that particular incident was hugely problematic to me and a major red flag of where we really are in Islam. I did um, follow up with Namras uh, when the final report came out to say, well, look, if you're all about journalistic integrity, um, how about you update all your listeners now that the facts are known? Uh, no reply. Um, so, unfortunately, well, he, he, he sums up the attitude of a lot of people, which is, I'd rather look the other way. I don't want to believe that these people aren't the saints that I've, you know, invested in all these years. Well, uh, for, for whatever reason, he chose to give a voice to the, to the uh, aggressor rather than to the victim. And uh, that's, uh, that's a choice he's going to have to live with. And well, anyway, that's, I, I don't really have anything else to add to that. Um, and right. he promoted an idea that normalizes child abuse. It's yeah. true, isn't it? It was very blasé. Yeah, well, we didn't have time. We were busy doing our service. We didn't have time to look out for out out for our children. These things happen. It was uh, stunning, um, as you say, normalizing it. All right, moving on forward. So then we got the Black to Chaitanya Swami unfortunate leak. In fact, initially it had the um, Iskon India Lokana Swami supporters all up in arms that he was exposing that the CPO had a plot that was being exposed. Um, the CPO certainly felt very misrepresented by Back to Chaitanya Swami's account of what had been discussed and agreed. Um, and this is where we hear that there's going to be a panel. Maybe we don't need to give it to the CPO. Maybe we'll set up a panel. Um, and as you said, Sanika, what was described in that inadvertent phone call that got leaked to the world very much is what played out. We could have almost predicted the game plan from that point. Were we surprised at um, the panel selection? and the basis for how various people ended up on said panel? No, the, I mean, the panel was stacked. They had, uh, uh, there was nobody um, representing the victim. Uh, there was two people representing the uh, perpetrator. Uh, yeah. The, the odds are definitely the, the, the panel was stacked in such a way so that where the uh, Lokanet had uh, uh, at, more than Lokanet, the GVC could have uh, uh, the intended outcome. That's how it was designed. Uh, and then uh, anyway, I don't know if we want to if it's too early to talk about the Saba, but we can also uh, basically Mahaman was one of the members of the panel. And then after so the panel recommended that the case is not handed to the GBC. Then the GBC came out with their official decision on it. And then they handed it to another body called uh, Saba, who is the Dastric Advisory Committee. I'm not sure exactly what Saba stands for. Uh, but this, this group of devotees has the authority by two thirds majority to send a resolution back to the GBC and tell them uh, this is not acceptable. You need to uh, look at it again. Now, Mahaman, who was one of the members of the panel, he was also a member of the Saba, and he didn't recuse himself and say, well, it, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to vote on whether my own decision uh, was uh, on my own decision. So I'm going to recuse myself from this, and so I'm going to uh, let others decide. He, he, he decided on both. He wasn't sitting on both panels. And the Saba decided that the majority decided that it needed to go back, but it didn't reach a two-thirds majority, so the CPO, or the, the GBC, just uh, that they, they went with what they wanted from the, from the very beginning. Yeah, I mean, the very existence of the panel was obviously already completely ad hoc. There's no basis for it there's no um, precedent no precedent it's another obvious attempt to circumvent uh cpo but it would actually beg a belief that they would offer two positions out of five 
to people with no legal background, no CPO background, that literal only qualification is they were avowed advocates for Logan and Swami to appease ISKCON India. So at that point, it was almost a foregone conclusion. And all of this becomes significant when we start to look at where did everything finally land and how are things being communicated all right so i need i need to say that it the, because they circumvented their own child protection policies um and created their own like ad hoc judiciary they are completely acting out of law they're acting they're breaking their word on so many levels and they're creating a precedence uh, well, they're, they're, they're undermine, they, they undermine their own authority. They undermine their own authority and they're creating a, um, you know, basically uh, an institutionalized loophole for gurus to abuse children. Well, That's what they've done. They've, been, they've put it into ISKCON precedent. Uh, Damodar, I just wanted to... Uh, Correct something you just said. You said that the the two Indian, the two representatives from India uh, on the panel did not have any child protection experience. Mahaman did not have any child protection experience. The other one was Bhakta Rupa. He did have uh, okay. some child protection experience. He did a wonderful work in Mayapur in 1990, investigating the abuse there. Oh, thanks he for did, clarity. Then he did a terrible work in Vrindavan uh, in 2015 or 16, investigating the child abuse there. But he did have some experience anyway. Sorry, continue. No, no, that's all good. All right. So, um, obviously, the panel took forever. We were asked for 60 days just to be patient. Um, eventually, we got the panel report leaked, which was another source of frustration to the GBC. They've never officially released their appendices, but the panel report has just been released in the last few days, along with the decision. So let's read the decision and let's read some of the Q&A, because this is where the main problems, uh, future problems, as you say, have just been um, uh, kicked into life. So GBC today released its decision regarding the status of Lokanath Swami. The resolution is attached below, along with other relevant documents. Um, that's the 73 plus page report. It's interesting that they wouldn't also send the appendices, which is where all the baseline evidence is. And in fact, I'm not sure how much sense the panel report makes in isolation. Um, it, it, it makes sense because uh, it gives, uh, it's like they put a piece of paper in your hand, but uh, so they've given you something, but they've given you nothing. But uh, anyway, the appendices are available on looking at .net, correct? It, it, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to um, bring up the several other documents, I think, what I'm looking for here. Okay, here we go. Um, all right, so I'll read the GBC decision and then the Q&A regarding decision. I think the GBC would like to think that their we promise not to interfere any more resolution will have everybody pacified. <laughs> of course, they've given us no reason to believe anything that they pledge. Um, yeah. All right, so this is the 20th of July, 2022 GBC decision. Um, Whereas in 1990, a devotee invited Lokanath Swami to stay with his family for several days while recovering from a serious injury. The host also requested Lokanath Swami to train and impart Indian culture to his youngest daughter, who was 11 and a half years old at the time, a minor. Whereas the minor alleged that Iskand's GBC, um, three years later, that Lokanath Swami had touched it inappropriately during his stay in the minor's home. Whereas the GBC took these allegations seriously and immediately launched an investigation, which including reaching out to the minor and her family. The investigation also included a review by independent mental health experts. The GBC also imposed certain restrictions on Logan Asami. Whereas the minor, then an adult, raised the issue again in 2010. Um, the GBC reopened the matter. Uh, whereas there was recently discussion about reopening the Logan Asami matter for a third time, whereas the GBC appointed a review panel um, Whereas the GBC found the review panel's in-depth and professional report to be helpful and insightful. Whereas the review panel members agreed unanimously 
that the allegations had been fully investigated both in 1993 and again in 2010. Now, those investigations were adequately documented. The Lokanath army substantially complied with the restrictions imposed. So this use of the word substantial is, is kind of interesting. What they're basically saying is, yes, he didn't actually comply with uh, informing his disciples. He stopped the practice of distributing the very sanitized letter. But otherwise, we think he more or less complied. That's what they mean by substantially complied. And the Lokanaswami matter be referred back to the GBC to act on the review panel's recommendations. There's a couple more whereas, or at least one more. Whereas the GBC plans to adopt the attached resolution. So we'll read that resolution. This is where they're saying, we promise not to interfere anymore in the future, despite the fact that we've done it again right now. Um, Right. Based on ISKCON's ecclesiastical principles and practices, as well as the report, be it therefore resolved that, one, the GBC body endorses the review panel's recommendation that the Lokanaswamy matter already tries to adjudicate and not be reopened for further proceedings as no new relevant facts pertaining to this matter have come to light. Um, and it's fair enough. In fact, we should probably have a separate session just unpicking the panel report, which is fascinating study in weasel words and legalese. Um, the GBC body, GBC body reaffirms its existing policy that an ISKCON regional governing body or similar has the right to restrict any devotee. So in essence, they're basically saying we're going to keep him in place, but we do give the right or confirm the right of local regional uh, zones to say he's not allowed to preach in our zone. Um, such has already been done in North America. So to their credit, the North American leaders have said, no, you can't come here anymore. And it does seem like devotees elsewhere are starting to explore the same in their regions. Lokana Swami shall not initiate disciples in person or virtually in any region or area where he's not been welcomed by the relevant RGB or similar body of, uh, of area leaders. In cases of rare exceptions that may be proposed to the RGB, the GBC Executive Committee will assist in reaching an agreeable outcome. So even that is clearly negotiable. This present resolution is based on and limited to the facts described herein. So there were some questions about what's that all about? Um, my read of that would be it's a sort of acknowledgement that there is a simultaneous um, rape allegation that's currently being investigated. And they're just saying this resolution applies to this and this alone. So I'll pause in case either of you want to say anything about what I've just read. To me, it's just, um, like you said, it's a, it was a foregone conclusion. And it, to me, just is another uh, symptom of the fact that over and over again, uh, they have consistently and repeatedly protected the perpetrator and continue to elevate him and not only, not only protect him, but elevate him in a position of guru. So the message is that child protection is irrelevant. And if a man is able to achieve sannyas and has some charisma uh, to become a guru, then those are the qualifications for qualified immunity to abuse children. Absolutely, That's absolutely. No, the, uh, the, 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 if I could put the handling of the Lokanet case in one sentence, it would be might is right. If you have this power, uh, it's all good. And I just read a comment that Saraswati put in, it popped up on my screen, where it says that the 2012 GBC decisions were actually more strict. Uh, resolutions on Lokanet were actually more strict. He was uh, he could only, uh, he was limited to India, whereas now he can go anywhere in the world where he's invited. So th th they're actually more lenient now than they were in 2012. They've been more lenient. Let's do the highlights because um, Anudam has also wrote, or ISKCON Communications has also written a Q&A. 
Is local national army still allowed to initiate disciples? Yes, in those parts of the world that welcome him to do so. North America has already determined he is not welcome to initiate or visit there. Uh, is local national army restricting his travel? Well, that's kind of obvious from what we said. Local RGBs may welcome or restrict. Um, he's actually to not travel unless welcomed or invited. Um, why didn't the GBC send this to the CPO when the allegations of abuse first rose? Well, here makes the argument it didn't exist in 1993, so we did send it to some equivalent body. Why not just send it to the CPO now? Oh, well, all the panel said it should have gone, but since it didn't, we don't want to send it again. There's nothing new that's come up. How did the majority and minority of the panel differ in their opinions? The primary difference... And you can, and I think actually we should have a whole session just on that panel report um, at some stage. In in essence, they they looked at it in a purely legalistic way. Yes, no new information has come out. It doesn't need to be reported again. But the minority, as in the two who were outvoted because of the stacked panel, uh, argued that even with the investigations having already found him guilty, we can still impose a different sentence. Um, without it having to be investigated again. Yes, because nothing more would come from an investigation. But with, they simply pointed out that, you know, previous people had had more severe consequences for lighter uh, offences and they were not in such significant roles. I think it's important also to mention that the, the panel uh, sought the uh, uh, legal advice of an expert in the field when uh, mm -hmm. they, to come to the conclusion, and he uh, strongly recommended that it would be in ISCON's best interest that Loken Atsami step down. Uh, and, but the GBC then they decided to disregard the professional opinion of this uh, lawyer, and we'll see where that goes. Well, I, I can't help but just continue to wave the red flag that why... There is actually no GBC resolution to give credibility for this ad hoc judiciary. There's no credibility to this panel at all. And uh, they've just like appointed some judiciary body that is completely irrelevant to ISCON policy to send cases to CPO, the Child Protection Office. And they have completely, it's, it's really a dereliction of duty for them to protect children and send that to law enforcement. And they've run out the clock on the um, statute of limitations in New Jersey is basically what they did with that body. What were the qualifications of the members of the panel? The five-member panel included all senior devotees, among them with some members holding more than one of the following qualifications. The panel included two attorneys, two former CPO directors, one former GBC member, one initiating guru, one GBC deputy, and two Prabhupada disciples. They were Three were from the U.S., two from India, and one from South Africa. Um, and the yeah, bias I mean, for all of those are to represent the per perpetrator. Why did the GBC put additional restrictions now if the panel said the case wasn't closed? Isn't that double jeopardy? So um, uh, they basically said, yes, the case wouldn't be reopened. New rest no new restrictions were put in place, as um, Saraswati has already pointed out. It's actually a lessening of restrictions. Why didn't Lokan Asani just step down or retire or resign? Why? Some leaders felt that that should be the best option. Others felt differently. However, following the panel report, no such action was mandated. So the panel is now being used very much as the shield. Oh, well, we can't. We just followed what the panel. So the panel, the panel, the panel, the panel. Big question. Does this mean that someone who abused a child can serve as a guru in ISKCON? Now, this is where we see gymnastics and contortions of the highest order. Someone should absolutely, you know, do a study of the a massive attempt to sidestep a very simple question. 
The question is never answered here, but the answer is kind of obvious. I'll, I'll just read the answer because it's spectacular in its obfuscation. <laughs> this charge is the crux of why this issue has come up several times in the past. Um, Damodar insert and will keep coming up. In short, did the GBC err in its 1996 decision and later decisions? And is Logan Asami a risk to others? So let's, let's ask a new question. As explained in the panel report, an extensive psychological assessment was conducted, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, uh, the answer is want... yes. The answer is uh, yes. Uh, Does this mean that someone who abused a child can serve it? <laughs> well, obviously, yes. Here we I have understand. someone who's continuing as a, a guru and is gone, though it's beyond any doubt that he abused the child, so therefore it's not it's no longer a disqualification. It's well, like what people also might believe. What acknowledging is that like, he says that he's no longer a threat. Well, one, how do they know, firstly? But secondly, this creates institutional harm. They, the, the problem with this case is that it's never just been about the uh, perpetrator and the victim. The, the institution has acted on behalf of the perpetrator and continued to institutionalize this legitimacy of child abuse by gurus over and over and over. And this gymnastics of words continues to do that. And it goes mm -hmm. on. Isn't the Jeep, sorry, you, you go, uh, Sanek. I, uh, I don't know, do you want to finish or do you? No, I was about to move on to the next bit. Okay, let's go, hold up. I, uh, something, uh, let me see if I can bring it up. Can you still see me? You're sideways now. <laughs> okay. Well, it's going to have to be sideways. Right? It's keeping with the gymnastics thing. Uh, so essentially, um, uh, Anuttama, or I'm guessing Anuttama wrote this thing. Uh, he changed the question. So first he asks, so does this mean that uh, a child abuser can be a guru? Then he goes in to change the question. He says, did the GBC make a mistake? Uh, is looking at a risk to others? Uh, that, that's a separate question. Uh, the question is, oh, my screen has just gone off. Yeah, it's a uh, sleight of hand for sure. Yeah, the, the, he never answered a question which he asks, which is, does that mean that someone has abused a child can serve as an Iskan guru? It's basically like his uh, pivot maneuver. Yeah. And it's well, very. Well, let's answer some of those questions. Yes, he did pose a risk to others. There, there are other allegations. There. Secondly, did the GBC make a mistake? Yes, repeatedly and ongoingly. And yes, it is okay for a child abuser to be a guru in ISKCON. Okay, so let's look at the next question. This has also kind of got the interesting similar tactic. Um, he must think we're all dumb not to see what he's doing. Isn't the that GBC one. caving in to pressure from certain parts of the world? Sorry, Sonnet. Uh, can you, did you, I think I got cut off. I was trying to You, say you froze something. for a minute, I think. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, basically, uh, Damodar, uh, sorry, Anuttam asked a question. Then instead of answering can he, uh, his question, which is, can, does this mean that child abusers can be gurus? He asks another question and he answers that the second question. Uh, which is basically treating his audience as, uh, as though they're stupid. It's like, <laughs> you guys, it's like, uh, but uh, I'd like to read what Vyasaki wrote about that. Uh, okay, he wrote, cool. He wrote a comment on my thread, which he, Vyasaki Prabhu, the singer, he wrote, well, it is now official. If any person asks whether a spiritual master in Iskand can have lusty desires for children, the answer is now an authoritative resounding yes. Uh, he goes on to say the GBC's mistake in judgment was to consider the merits of the case um, on an individual rather than on the base uh, uh, now rather than base the case on Shastra, Tattva, and Dharma. That was Vyasaki Prabhu's uh, observations. Uh, but yeah, essentially now the GBC has officially set the precedent that. You can't abuse children and be a guru, and it's all hunky dory. And uh, well, they've reconfirmed. They've reconfirmed. They have. They have. They, 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 that's been what they've done all along, and now they have made an official statement confirming that. 
And, and it's, to, to me, the, 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 the repercussions of this decision, we're going to see them 30, 50 years down the line. It's going to be catastrophic because uh, I, I, I can see that 50 years down the line, we're going to have people uh, battling with these things and they will say, well, Prabhupada's direct disciples made this decision. It means that this is okay. And th th there, there won't be any Prabhupada's direct disciples who say, yeah, that was messed up. Uh, this is not okay. This is the people precedent that these guys are setting. People often ask me because I've for years explained, you know, the famous old saying, never, never attribute to evil what can be explained by stupidity. And I've often opined this is simply incompetence. It's actually becoming harder and harder to make that case. It really is. Like you could I, argue in yeah. 1993, maybe people were naive. But now, you know, we've had Jeffrey Epstein. We've had that film producer, Weinstein or whatever, you know, Me Too. And they're still doubling down on. Well, look this, at this our own. Okay. We don't even need to go outside of ISKCON to look at historical references. We, you know, ISKCON declared bankruptcy to avoid being held accountable for all of the levels of abuse. And and just to make a point about that is that since the institution dealt with that as a class action lawsuit, then all of the individual abusers weren't held accountable so they've acted as a protective uh institution of child abusers for decades yeah all right let's have a look at the last couple of bits here isn't the gbc caving into pressure from certain parts of the world we have the same tactic of not answering the question the question the answer is clearly yes had had India not flexed its muscles in May and threatened, you know, secession, you know, hiving off the Indian temples from the rest of the movement, then they would have probably continued with the referral that they'd made to the CPO. Anyway, what did we get as an answer? No genuine member of ISKCON condones abuse of the vulnerable. The most important questions are, what is needed to protect children? What are suitable responses to, to abuse? Different severity of abuse. None of this relates to, was there pressure from a certain part of the world? Yes, yes, there was. And it was so compelling that, as we've discussed, they basically abandoned all principles to say, we need to hold on to those Indian temples. Um, because if we, if we rule against, you know, this um, poster boy of the Indian Yatra, uh, that's it. You know, we, we, we've got problems on our hands. In my study of childhood development, there are four levels of protection of children. And the idea that we respond appropriately to abuse is already a low level of protection. The real level of protection is when they don't get abused to begin with. Yeah. So that's, when, you know, that's their, their level of upholding child protection is at a very low level. Last couple of uh, parts of this document, and then we should look at this new resolution. The, okay, we messed up this time, but we promised to never, ever, 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 ever do it again. Therefore, everyone should be everyone should be really happy with that. Um, won't this decision just add to more disappointment and bitterness? Yeah. It is hoped that ISKCON devotees who are concerned, as many will be, will take the time to study the panel report, which we've only sent you half of, and the GBC decisions released today. The GBC spent many hours seeking a fair, reasonable and balanced decision, understanding it's not possible to satisfy all observers. Now, there's, again, there's something very telling in that not possible to satisfy. We knew that we couldn't keep both India and the rest of the world happy. We went with India, basically. Well that's no, but no, but they did it because India is not happy. That, but that's that, that's the to me, it, it's the madness. It's just insanity. What's what we're witnessing insanity. So the GBC says we can't make people happy, as if as if that's uh, as if uh, satisfying people is the base for justice. So it's like as if uh, justice is decided by popular vote. That's the first, that seems to be the premise of it. It's like oh, if there was just one party, then we would do whatever they want, regardless of justice. And now what they've done is they have uh, the India is actually quite upset because the panel specifically uh, confirms that Lokana did abuse the child. So that India is not happy. And the um, 
whoever is uh, trying to campaign for child protection is also not happy because uh, we have a guru. So they've, they've made nobody happy and they haven't made a principal decision. If they had made a principal decision, at least it's like, forget who's happy, just make the, the damn principal decision. And in that, and again, in addressing like whoever's happy, it's again, just representing, trying to protect and smooth over the offenses of the perpetrator. And there's been no, like completely, the victim is lost in this process. There's no, that they're, they're just, it's just a PR. Like talking about making people happy is a public relations ac ac uh, exercise. But this is definitely, um, it, it's gone communications. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about protecting individual children. So they they got a final couple of things. One is, you know, is, is, um, Lokan Aswami still a GBC? Well, he never was a GBC. He was only ever a minister. So we took the, that Padiatra minister, Kirtan minister, off him and we gave it to one of his disciples. Um, okay, so then they came up with a new decision, one that you would might have supposed was already implicit. And given that they happily breached their decisions whenever it suits, I don't know why they would expect this to pacify or satisfy anybody but let me just quickly read it whereas the gbc body has created various iscon agencies offices and committees to which it has delegated authority to deal with abuse of minors leadership sexual misconduct and other transgressions in, involving iscon sannyasis gurus leaders and members as of the date as of the date hereof these agencies offices and committed are iscon child protection office um, the Prevention of Leadership Misconduct Office, ISKCON Sanyas Ministry and Guru Services Committee. Whereas a few of these agencies, offices and committees such as the ISKCON Sanyas Ministry and Guru Services Committee contain within their guidelines provisions by which the GBC may be called to act as a decision-making or appellate adjudicatory body, so you could appeal to them. Whereas the GBC recognizes the necessity for these agencies, offices, and committees to function without the intervention of the GBC, except in circumstances where the guidelines of these agencies, offices, and committees provide otherwise, be it therefore resolved that henceforth all allegations of conduct risking or resulting in the physical or emotional harm, sexual abuse, or exploitation of a minor shall be directly and automatically referred to ICPO. All allegations of a sexual act or behavior by an ISCON leader with adults or other misconduct which are in violation of the standard of behavior for ISCON leaders, as contained in ISCON law, as well as the Code of Ethical Behavior, directly and automatically to the PLMO. Um, and anyway, it goes on. So I think what they're hoping is we promise that we will in the future always send things and we will never interfere, even though we did it this time, even though the panel said it was wrong that we did it this time. And even though we stuck by all of the decisions that we made through our interference this time, we promise to never, ever do it again, ever. What do we think of that? Is that, is that, does, do we feel like this is progress? No. no the no interference pledge? There's also language in there where ISKCON thinks that it's a judicial system. Yeah. It's not. Um, it's, it's, it, it's, it's really just not uh, a judicial system. It's a, it's a religious organization and a spiritual community. And it's, the GBC has proven over and over again that it's, um, unable to appropriately deal with these issues, create policy, they don't follow their own policy, and they've broken the trust of so many countless families. And they don't care about families or children or women, clearly. No, they don't. So but if we want to recap, so they... Uh... They stacked a panel. They, they created a panel that had... Uh, An illegitimate uh, panel. They, 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 they created this illegitimate panel uh, with, uh, with five people. Two of them were supporting okay. the uh, aggressor, the, the perpetrator. Nobody was there representing the victim. 
Uh, and then it appears that Naveen Sham from Dallas was the uh, swing vote that uh, put, uh, gave the majority to, of the panel. Um, so then uh, after they, they create this, un this whole underhanded thing, uh, now they're saying, but we're not going to do it again. To me, if anything, the biggest uh, success, uh, the, the best news of this whole uh, this unfortunate uh, series of events is that now um, everybody has been able to witness the extent of the corruption of the GDC body and yeah. the, um, how far they will go and the, the, like the nepotism that you can see in how far they went to protect one of their own who abused a child and to uh, prop him up in the position of guru. That undermines the GDC, it undermines the guru, it undermines, the, they got zero credibility. And along the way, they also lost the Saba. The this, this Saba body was, uh, it, it's a relatively new body. Uh, it's been around, I don't know, a year or two, but this was like their... Um, First, first big test, public, yeah. The first big test, it was their first public appearance. It was the first time many devotees even heard the name of this body, that they even knew it existed. And uh, sure enough, uh, they couldn't. So these guys are all experts. Allegedly, they're all experts on Shastra. And, uh, no, it's, not, it's nothing to do with Shastra advisory. No, what is that's it? Not, that's not what the essay is. I, I'll have to look up what the actual meaning. But it's 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 an advisory body. There certainly are some learned people on there, but it's not a shastric. Uh, okay, my uh, my. Uh, yeah. my but essentially, this body is supposed to, you know, uh, give checks and balances uh, to uh, to the GBC, and somehow in these in these, what, what do we see that we couldn't get a two thirds majority out of these uh, people who are so so to say, no, it's not okay for a guru to abuse children. For somebody who's abused a child to be a guru, it's not acceptable. We couldn't get a two-thirds majority in there. What does that mean? It means that the Saba boat uh, sunk before it left the harbor. In my view, it's like they couldn't even make it past their uh, their debut uh, case. And it's like, Well, whatever... apparently there was a majority on Saba that voted to return this for reconsideration, but they needed a two-thirds majority. For no, I, no, for yeah. sure, for sure. But we couldn't get a two-thirds majority. It means that, that there is not enough people on there who think that th th there's, or rather there's enough people on there who think that it's okay for uh, somebody who's abused children to be a guru that uh, it, they, they let it pass. So what does this mean that whatever currency of cred like credibility is the only currency that has any value in a society like ISKCON, whatever credibility people may have been willing to give to this body on account of the fact, oh, I know this devotee is a nice devotee, he's on the Saba, maybe the Saba, there is some hope with this body. Uh, it's gone. It's finished. It's like it, it's another useless body that is uh, there's enough corrupt people in there that they'll they'll, they'll push anything through. The, the terrifying thing that I've witnessed, I think, mm -hmm. in the last year is the amount of people disinterested in the truth, ready to make up light, ready to threaten, ready to believe all kinds of nonsense. And even for the ICC, which is, you know, the um, essentially the leadership parliament of the Indian Yatra, you know, to basically say, we'll split over this. I mean, there were quotes there, you know, these Westerners, they even think it's wrong to smack your kids. Well, we do it every day. There was, that was also David Kinnan. We, he, had a particular, yeah. he played a particular blinder. I mean, and so we don't have a shared view as to what level of safety a child should even be afforded, whether that's to do with their sexual uh, safety or any other kind of safety. Um, at any point in time, the movement can still split. Certainly, the um, the leadership team, uh, the GBC, have basically indicated that even if their initial instinct is to make a morally informed decision, as soon as anyone has the slightest bit of leverage over them, they will cave and they will do what's expedient. And to me, it, it's certainly raising whether... Um, you know, this cohort can be trusted with the leadership of Prabhupada's movement or whether, in fact, they have now made their position untenable. 
I think that's the only thing uh, you and the uh, ICC, one of the few things you and the ICC agree on. On that, we agree. <laughs> we might have uh, what, a different idea of... What, uh... <laughs> one thing I wanted to add about the Saba is that the Saba invited, or some members of the Saba invited uh, Brahma Tirta, uh, Bob Cohen from uh, Perfect Questions, Perfect Answers. They invited Brahma Tirta to speak to the Saba members in defense of Lokanat Maharaj. Uh, I, God help me, I don't know why um, Brahma Tirta seems to have this uh, 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 soft spot for child abusers, uh, but they didn't invite anybody to, uh, to from the opposition to, uh, our, to, to make a presentation on the importance of child protection. And uh, so that's, it's like, that's how they reached their conclusion. They, again, one, they, they, anyway, uh, one thing I Well, they've set up their own office and they argue that child protection is grounded in, you know, quasi psychological science that they reckon is antithetical to the Vedic system. I mean, there's some very, very scary rhetoric coming out. The Indian, um, yeah. The, the strange thing about the um, Indian, the devotees from the ICC and the Indian Yatra is that they got, uh, they were up in arms uh, when uh, Malati Prabhu made that uh, unfortunate uh, remark. Uh, he, she wrote that in uh, her... Uh, she that, told what she said was a joke that she yeah, learned from she, an Indian. She told this joke she learned from an Indian, whatever it is, the, the, the whole, that you really unified, it was like, uh, it really unified the whole Indian contingent. They were all up in arms. How dare you? Uh, that's so racist. How dare you portray us in such a light? But then you look at their actions and they essentially said, if you don't let us keep our child abusing guru, uh, we're going to uh, separate. And I'm like, well, you made her case. <laughs> What are you upset about? I, it, to me, it's just mind-boggling uh, how these same people, like the, the cognitive dissonance that I'm witnessing is just um, beggars this belief. Anyway. Well, it was definitely faux outrage for sure. It wasn't, um, it, it, it was a it, convenient comment was, to jump all very, over. It was very convenient. <laughs> a convenient comment. Look, um, we've gone two hours. I really appreciate you both um, you know, going the distance on a marathon session. Obviously, there's still plenty to talk about here. It's amazing, isn't it, how we, um, we we feel like we're still only scratching the surface in some of these areas. But I'm really grateful. Obviously, both of you have played an enormous part in nudging child protection forward. It is horrendous that it's um, still such a sluggish response that we get, or even that we get attacked by the antibodies who want to see these these efforts for child protection as somehow um, problematic. But um, I do feel, as you say, that there's some significant things in the findings, uh, even though it's shocking that we've got these decisions, they're not fixed in stone. And in fact, um, it's clearly not going to be the end of the story. It really clearly is. But thank you so much for giving so abundantly of your time today. Um, hopefully we'll have Saraswati on soon and she'll be able to fill in a whole bunch of the gaps that we've left. Mm -hmm. and there's so much more to say here. To be honest, my uh, the GBCs have shown such uh, they're pushovers essentially. So to, to my mm -hmm. view, my my forecast is that this uh, this resolution is final until enough pressure comes up where the GBC is going to say, oh, uh, okay, let's revisit that. That's to me, that's a, that's how final this resolution is, and all of it. Um, do we? Are there any questions in the comments or interesting? I've been sharing. I've been sharing every comment that I've seen, not notwithstanding sometimes long after it was posted. Okay. Um, anything else? I just. I'm sure there'll be more. Ch there'll be more chat, and this will get shared yeah. for people who weren't able to see it live. Sorry, KD. I just wanted to say, you know, because Shanik had made a point that the ramifications of this case will, you know, shine into the next 50 years, so to speak. So um, even though I feel a, a strong sense of um, disillusionment, uh, the reason I'm even here today is because I at least it's not going without challenge that the challenge is documented 
that the the case has been well documented and it's being um, revealed so that even though these decisions are being made and will have uh, ramifications that hopefully this activism for the rights of children and Vaishnava children specifically um, will have a future as well. So that's, you know, my hope. No, I agree. I agree. In, in that sense, uh, the, the, this campaign has been a huge success because now the facts are very clear for everybody. Before, there was a lot of uh, uncertainty, a lot of unknowns. Now it's been clear. Uh, one thing about child protection uh, is that uh, in my head, I would like to be 50 years ahead of where we are now. Uh, but reality doesn't... Uh, accommodate for my wishes and wants reality is what it is so i need to adjust to the pace of progress that is taking place and there is in some ways there is progress and um, try to push that progress and also be patient for me these are two things that uh, for me personally i need to really uh, uh, remind myself of um go ahead well i i really wanted to echo what this facebook user here has, has said the fact that we're even documenting this conversation means this is also a part of the record um and you know whether we see the transformation in our lifetimes which we would sincerely hope so uh or whether we're simply passing the torch on to others um the point is, it, this is such an unsustainable situation. Uh, it's doing incredible damage to Prabhupada's movement. Um, and it's scary that the leaders themselves don't appreciate that, that as Vyasaki put it so eloquently, they've made a decision um, based on expedience rather than based on dharmic considerations, rather than based on Shastra and so on. So, of course, it will... Um, it's a cowardly decision, let's face it. It's moral cowardice. They've basically given in to a threat. It's a threat that doesn't go away. So this card can be played any time India wants to push its uh, its position on things. Like you said, female Diksha Gurus. Um, this is a very unfortunate thing for it to take a stand. Can you imagine the Indian press, you know, finally documenting, well, this is why the schism came about. Yeah. Um, well, who, just... who, who, yeah. Sorry, just to comment also about something you said before about, you know, this, um, that in India it's more culturally acceptable to uh, hit their children or something like that, use corporal punishment. And um, I think that it needs to be stated that there's a much different, uh, there's a big difference between experiencing and dealing with abuse within a family than an institution choosing to protect uh, and perpetuate child abuse as an institution at the highest level. And uh, that distinction just needs to be made. It's a great point. And, you know, Vedic inquiry is very much around the institution. I think from the very time that we set it up, it was how do we create more awareness of information, greater vigilance and, and so on, better protection measures, but also better responses, including the right kind of support for victims. Let it, let it be noted that the victim wasn't mentioned in this recent GBC resolution or in the Q&A, wasn't even considered. Uh, it wasn't even on the radar at all. No, they and, think that the perpetrator is the victim. Yeah, yeah. We've got to do the but, right thing by our Swamiji. But also, I think it's important to um, note that uh, just because something is part of Indian uh, culture, tradition, it doesn't make it good. Uh, oh. When uh, when the British came to India, they, they, they uh, uh, abolished uh, infanticide because they were killing baby girls because they wanted boys and the dowry. I don't know what... what all the reasons were, but they abolished it. So is it just because something comes from India? It's not, 
it doesn't mean that it's good just because they're beating kids in India. It doesn't mean that it's a good thing. Uh, just, well, also uh, as an international society, we should pay heed to the um, United Nations definition of the rights of the child. And it's a, and India is part of the United Nations. And I'm sure there's plenty of child ad advocates in India who um, go to the UN to, uh, to on behalf of children. So um, all of those things, you know, children are not property. Children are people. <laughs> Well, and Vedic Inquirer's work has to go on. So this was, it was never a single, you know, issue uh, subject. It's about child protection in general. As you're saying there, KD, there's so much that needs to be done to improve the lot of children in Prabhupada society. Um, I also don't think this case is just over you know, by any means. Um, we're just sort of taking stock as to its current state. I thank all members of Vedic Inquirer for being uh, active contributors. I hope that people share this widely and it's it gets the right kind of coverage and the right kind of hearts and minds around the place but a big thank you to both of you for taking yeah. so much of your uh, weekend to have this conversation and we look yeah we look forward to the saraswati edition coming very soon Hare krishna Hare Bolo. um one last thing i wanted to add before we close is yes that, yes um uh the the tone of the conversation we're having is, um, I mean, the content is very important and the tone is adversarial, uh, meaning that it's uh, divisive and maybe necessarily so, maybe that's unavoidable. Uh, but on a, in a different conversation, in a different discussion, ideally, uh, what I would like is to have the conversation of how is it possible to create uh, a bridge and somehow to communicate to the, the importance uh, for, for, the, for society, for the individual, for the collectively, for ISKCON of uh, of child protection, like the rather than uh because there was a lot of uh anutama bashing and what he wrote and what he and gbc bashing here which i think it's very they, they earned every bit of it but how do my my question is how do we communicate successfully to the gbc and is it possible to communicate successfully to the gbc and to india the importance of what uh we're trying to do is it possible? I don't know. I'd the, I like I like to hope it is. The model is being uh, that there, it's possible to have loyal opposition, right? This is like a British value that the monarch, in our case, we would have Srila Prabhupada is the, is the unifier and our faith in Krishna. That And Krishna is the supreme child. So if we can place them at the center then then we can be i also offer my adversarial position as service so i do um i i i do hope that people in the gbc can hear me and understand that um you know i come from uh, a place in my heart to protect the children of the future I agree. We definitely need to um, find a way to work constructively. It wasn't actually for want of reaching out. Uh, you know, as you might remember, Seneca, we initially reached out even before establishing Vedic Inquirer to get some advice as to how to best advance the child I, protection agenda. I, I, I've been trying to reach out for a few years now. And, yeah, exactly. Uh, so I, I, I'm sure my methods uh, can, uh, can be improved. But yeah. To me, I, the very fact, sorry, go on. No, I agree 100% with KD that her uh, adversarial uh, offering is valuable. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> to, to me, the very fact that that initial response in May of last year was what it was, is actually a, a bright spot, even though the antibodies very rapidly kicked in to expel <laughs> this this. Odd alien kind of, you know, influence. response. Yeah. 
Yeah, but the fact is, um, I do think we've created massive more awareness. I do think that the GBC know that they can't pull an issue like this again. Like, you know, with that particular policy that's come in, you know, will that potentially be used to fend those off who are trying to interfere in the Lakshmi Moni uh, case and, and so on? Um, so I do think that uh, what we saw was a, a knee-jerk reaction, almost a last, a last stand type of reaction. I mean, um, let's see. I don't want to be, uh, you know, too hopeful. I actually think we are making some headway. Notwithstanding, this was a terrible, terrible decision and so badly communicated. Um, but it's out there. And, you know, the, the story will roll on for a little bit. Let's let everybody go. I like the fact that you've left, you've left us with the thought of uh, a conciliatory approach going forward. Um, thank you for that reminder. Thank you both. Thank you anyone that's watched it. And yes, please share it and please stay tuned. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.